I can stand here. <laughs> um, all right, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening, everybody. It is a nice uh, summer evening and we're really happy to have um, all of you here with us at the Africa Center. My name is Uzo Dima Iwala. I'm the CEO of the Africa Center and it's my, my great pleasure to welcome you here um, for the first discussion in our What's Happening series. Um, our What's Happening series is really designed to help people get into the details behind some of the things that you might see about the continent of Africa or the diaspora on the news. Um, and it's this discussion, we're really, really excited to have an esteemed panel here um, to really dive into some of the things that have been happening in Sudan. But before I turn um, over to our moderator really quickly, I just wanna give you just a quick um, uh, note about what the Africa Center is. Obviously you're in this space. We have another space on the other side. You've probably seen the flags that are going up um, on the plaza over there. The center um, really were about sharing new ideas, new narratives, um, and a vision for the continent, a vision for the future of the continent. And we do that by having discussions like this, programs and policy, business and culture, um, inviting the community in to share your ideas. This place is your place. It's a home for you um, to, to, as you can say in this place, sit, eat, drink, be merry, but also to exchange ideas with each other, um, to, to learn new things about the continent and to, to really dialogue with each other and with us about who we are as Africans or people interested in the continent of Africa and diaspora peoples. Um, you can follow us on Instagram at the Africa Center, same for all the socials. The website is theafricacenter.org, but really just check back for programs in this series, what's happening. Um, again, about current events on the continent and, and the sort of the nuance and, and the deeper meaning or understandings behind them. And of course, check back with us for other programs that we have here, whether it's coming to Turinga to eat or some of the exhibitions we'll be putting on or the programs we'll be doing outdoors during the summer, um, uh, during our summer sessions. But we're really grateful to you all for joining us this evening. We're really excited that you're all here. Um, and with that, um, I will turn over to Shadin, who's our um, moderator for the evening to introduce our panelists um, and begin the discussion. Thank you very much and thank you to you all. Hello everyone. Thank you. So, as we say in Sudan, assalamu alaikum, we welcome you. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. My name is Shadin. I've been in Brooklyn for the past seven years. Uh, my work really focuses on health equity and mental health, and I, I received my MPH uh, from Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health, where I focused on forced migration, humanitarian, act, humanitarian action, and refugee health. So sometimes it feels a bit ironic to be experiencing the thing that you study or studied, uh, but just want to remind all of us of the very personal nature of politics and that we're not divorced from the experiences of that. And so I'm just going to introduce our panelists First of all is Ismail Kushkush. He is a journalist who has contributed to many, many, many of the platforms that you all visit, including the New York Times, the Atlantic. He was based in Khartoum for eight years and was acting bureau chief for the New York Times in East Africa, based in Nairobi, Kenya. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree in History and International Relations from UC Davis with a focus on Africa and the Middle East and a Master of Arts degree in Journalism from Columbia's Journalism School in New York here. And he's also a Samuel Newhouse Foundation Fellow and is extremely well-versed and accomplished in this region and in Sudan, and we're very lucky to have him here today. And we also have Sueba Tom. She's a Sudanese-American actively engaged in organizing rallies and marches within the Sudanese community. In addition to being an activist, she's a mother, she's a daughter, she is a force. And so she was actually visiting Sudan during the time of the conflict breaking out, and so we're very happy to have her back safely. Uh, with us, dialing in from Doha is Khalid al -Bih, and he was born in Romania and raised in Qatar and is an award-winning artist. Uh, he's the founder of the acclaimed platforms, uh, Sudan Artist Fund, the Sudan Artist and Design Library, and he's been commissioned by prestigious organizations such as Amnesty International. His work uh, is diverse and aims to have a profound impact in bridging the global art scene and the fight for human rights. And I'm sure most of you have seen a lot of his work, not just, you know, depicting the conflict in Sudan, but also police brutality here in the United States. So again, we're in great company today. And so as they introduce, the whole purpose of today is to talk about what's happening in Sudan. And 
I can't emphasize enough how important it is to hear from Africans, to hear from people when it comes to the narratives, New York ambiance. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's extremely important to hear from Sudanese people about what's happening in Sudan. I think it goes without saying that the media, you know, often fails to offer the full humanity and full scope of who are actually experiencing these crises. And so our first question is really to the whole panel asking what's happening in Sudan. And I invite you to answer it, you know, from a personal place as well. And actually, before we do that, I would like us to take a moment of silence, 10 seconds, just to honor all of those who've been lost at the hands of government sanctioned violence from Darfur to the Nuba Mountains to Khartoum and beyond. And so just hold a moment of silence for them. Thank you. And I'd also just like to offer a trigger and content warning. We will be talking about war, violence, and potentially other topics, including sexual violence that are consequences of war and conflict. So um, without further ado, we'll begin again asking the panel what's happening in Sudan. And if you could please speak to both the personal and the political landscape, uh, that'd be great. And so I'll start with Sueba. Hi, everyone. Uh I think the best way to describe this is like uh, it was on Saturday, April 15. And I remember walking out like uh, I woke up on the like my phone was ringing and and then my sister was screaming, oh, they're shooting us. Uh, someone is trying to kill us. Uh, she lives in a place called Bahri, which is central Khartoum. And she was living um, near one of the rabbit support forces, uh, uh, the militia that we're going to talk about. Uh, one of the, the main like conflicts. So, so she was just start screaming and we were all just like scared. And then shortly after we start hearing the bullying actually coming in like, like very, very close to our house. So we were like, I guess the first thing we just like took shelter, like we just like stayed under bed and start like kind of checking our phones, trying to see the news of what's happening to find that uh, that the army, the military uh, is like having a conflict with the rabbit support forces, which is their allied militia. They've always been friends, but it's a time that now they've disagreed. And, um, and, uh, and the result was just like a very, very brutal clash. So gun they didn't stop for that day. My kids were not with me. They were with their, that, that, that family. And I was told that all bridges were closed. So you think in my mind at this moment is like, I'm dying here and I'm never gonna see my kids. Um, so we just we just waited um, for this next three days. We were just like under the sounds, so the, the bullet and the fights. Um, where I live is start getting like slower so because the fight starts moving down like central Khartoum. And, um, and I was just trying to find like an easy access. I could never ask my kids to come or their father to bring them. But I was just thinking that I need to find a way. I need to like escape and I need to bring my kids. Um, uh, thankfully in, in three days, their dad was able to find a safe route. Um, it was Ramadan also. So we were fasting and like dealing with everything, thinking about everything. Um, and then thinking that like, even during the time of prayers, which is a very holy time for people, um, that you would be hearing actually gunshots with the sounds of like the mosque and the like uh, the the prayers happening. Then you will hear like all of the all of the all of the shooting and the fighting and the and the and the bullet sounds. So my kids came. Then after that, I start thinking about what's happening <laughs> because at this time for me, the whole things just seems to be like families being apart and that's what everyone felt at that moment that you're either not with your kids you're either not with your mom you're either not with your family and everyone was just trying to find a way to reunite uh to like understand like what's happening so the uh the fight erupted and uh, i guess i'll leave it to Ismail to share some of his experience as well thank you well, thank you um, April 15th, fighting uh, breaks between the Sudanese army and the Rapid Support Forces. For those who don't know, the Rapid Support Forces, the RSF, um, grew out of a militia uh, previously known as the Janjaweed, uh, responsible for um, 
crimes in um, the western part of the country in, in Darfur. Um, the background to this, of course, is in, in 2019, uh, you have a, a Sudanese people uh, in an uprising, in a revolution, uh, dislodged the authoritarian government of Omar al-Bashir. Um, the rapid support forces is officially a part of the army, but not really so. Um, there was this arrangement, uh, there was an agreement that was made in 2019 between the civilian forces, uh, the pro-democracy forces, and the military with its various components, um, including the army and the RSF, um, who never really liked each other. The RSF really being a militia that never really uh, was a, an official a part of the army, uh, but managed in a few years to be better equipped uh, to have its own economy, um, led by um, a man known as um, Hamad Hamdan Dagalo, probably known as Hamati. Um, at a personal level, um, I was uh, living in Sudan for a year, working on a few writing projects. I uh, was hoping to work on a book um, and renting a studio in downtown Khartoum, about three blocks from the Republican Palace. I woke up Saturday morning, like most people, and um, woke up, uh, this is again Ramadan, um, you know, first waking up for the pre-dawn uh, meal and then going back to sleep, waking up again, um, hoping to uh, run a few errands, and um, I hear gunshots. Um, I wasn't sure, uh, so I called a friend uh, if they had heard anything. Uh, 10 minutes later, uh, it's machine gun fire. Um, I go out to my balcony, um, start taking filming, seeing what's happening, um, and then go out in my building. I live in a was living in a building about 32 people, um, half were internationals of different uh, nationalities. And the owner of the building comes out and says, "Stay in your apartment. There's fighting outside in the street." Um, I was stuck in the building for about 10 days. Um, uh, water was getting low, food was running out. Uh, there was about five children beneath the ages of 16, um, elderly. Um, it, you know, for 10 days, we uh, were debating 32 people of what to do, how to get out. Um, long story short, we eventually managed uh, to get out, walk out um, and split into different directions. Uh, those who wanted to be evacuated out of Sudan uh, did so. Some went to other parts of the of the city, but uh, again, people have different experiences. Um, um, actually, living um, the fighting, I've written about conflict. To be actually a part of the story was was again a different uh, experience altogether. Thank you, Khalid. Do you want to share your thoughts as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I left Sudan around like a month and a half before the conflict uh, happens. And that was the last time I actually seen Ismail. And we, um, everyone in Sudan at the time felt that something was happening, something was going to happen. And this is, this is not something that, you know, um, came out of nothing. It's, 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 you know, everyone knew that there, they can't be two commanders running this country. And, um, Everyone, I think, including the army and the RSF, were preparing for that moment. You walk around Khartoum, and each one, each camp is building and um, fortifying their camp even more. But it's no one thought it's going to happen. It's just every, every, everybody just denied it, you know. Even though all the all the signs were there. Um, when the fighting did break out, um, basically we were just stuck uh, to the TV and the social media and people trying to get to not understand what's going on and um, who's in power, who's not, where is everybody, how is everyone going to leave, is everyone going to leave, everybody's um, father, mother, cousins, you know, the, the big family houses. Um, People just, you know, try to make different decisions and on where to go and how, you know, if they can afford to go and if it's safe to go. And and um, because of uh, my social media presence, I was um, 
I was kind of playing the mediator, uh, getting, trying to figure out what's the latest news and what's happening and uh, who needs what, whether it's like people need water or people need a safe way out or, and, and just trying to um, kind of talk to the right people um, and just find buses and numbers of buses and doctors and where's the available medicine and um it's it was it was it was well, a lot of things were happening except for news there was no news no one knew knows anything until today actually no one knows what's going on in the ground it's it's a it's a big um there's no reporters on the ground and and things got de deteriorated very much i think after the um after the internationals have left and uh, that was, I think, one of the most um, disappointing moments for the Sudanese people, just being left alone. And um, yeah, I mean, until today, no one knows what's really happening. There's supposed to be um, peace talks in Jeddah, but again, no one knows what's happening at all. Uh, just social media videos uh, of the people uh, from both sides, uh, soldiers from both sides, claiming victory every day. Yeah. Thank you. So all of you have spoke to the ways in which the onus has fell on Sudanese people to coordinate their evacuation, to coordinate, you know, finding out what the safest routes are. And as we said in the beginning, the very personal nature of this, like my mom and grandma also we're in Sudan at the time that the conflict erupted. And so, you know, for those of us on the outside, to Khalid's point, we didn't have a lot of information. It was just like trying to mobilize people and say, okay, like if you're in Khartoum, try to make it to Port Sudan. From Port Sudan, try to make it to Jeddah. Um, so I'm just like curious to hear a little bit more about this spirit of like mutual aid and the ways in which like resistance committees were really the ones mobilizing when the international community, be it our governments or media, drop the ball? Well, I mean, I can speak a little bit about media coverage. And um, so I think the biggest challenge to media coverage is just access uh, to Sudan. Khartoum is not a media hub. It's not Cairo, it's not Nairobi, it's not Beirut. Um, there are a limited number of permanently based uh, journalist uh, for, for the from the outside. Of course, you have your local um, media outlets, uh, newspapers, um, um, online platforms, uh, some of the regional um, media outlets, uh, particularly in Arabic, like Al Jazeera and Al Arabi and Al Hadith. Um, and these are the permanently based uh, journalists. But A, um, for journalists to go out on the street was just simply not safe. Um, uh, journalists were targets. Um, in the building that I lived in, um, I was told that RSF soldiers went in, um, knocked, and were asking, are there army soldiers? Are there journalists in the building? Um, a part of me uh, um, felt you know, very difficult. I mean, knowing that I'm in the middle of the town and, and could cover this, um, but not having the proper equipment, not having um, enough electricity, uh, internet access, it would have just would have been very difficult. So access, I think, is, is a, 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 one of the challenges um, at the moment. For the journalists who are trying to come in from outside of Sudan, at the moment, there is no functioning government. Um, I mean, other than Port Sudan, um, um, there might be some access to Port Sudan, but getting to Khartoum, to other parts of the country, I think will just be uh, very difficult uh, to get the a proper uh, access uh, security-wise. Uh, the internet service is, is not uh, reliable. Um, and, and then, you know, the, the, the stringers and, and fixers, the local journalists that you normally work with, um, um, do they have the proper safety gear? So that I think is one of, one of the issues right now with getting uh, proper coverage of, of, of the conflict, uh, of the fighting um, in, in Khartoum. Um, as to groups, um, yes, I think this mutual aid, I mean, I, uh, um, 
one group uh, I have been in contact um, with 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 the electricity that we had. You know, I mean, I, you know, the 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 to keep your phone charged in in those. I mean, the, the um, electricity charge became a hard currency. You know, just keeping your phone at twenty percent and just trying to make sure that you could contact your family or news outlets and so forth. Um, I think was in itself a challenge. But getting in contact with groups, um, resistance committees, and other others um, help uh, to help evacuate from one neighborhood to the other. Um, I think definitely played a, an important role in getting people out. Say, but you wanna? Yeah. So I I can like I I think. I would actually say this in full, like, I think they are the one, like the resistance committee, they are the one that they are holding the country right now. We, everyone left us, like, like uh, international organization, NGOs, day one, day two, everyone were evacuated. Uh, there was no help in the ground. So I think uh, like, and this is again, I think this is the way how the nature of all of the resistance committee, they really like coming from that ground of understanding the needs of the people. So what they did immediately is they just form internal like um, committee subgroups and they start like providing all of the assistance. The lack of information was key because like, for example, for me to get to know a safe route to get to my kids, the only way is to start asking people like, because there is no way to know which route is safe and how to go and where to access. So they provided all of this information using whatever internet lab, like they would use like um, social media, Facebook, but also like direct text messages or just phone calls trying to communicate with different neighborhoods and try to provide that that supply so for example in my neighborhood i, I live in in Umdurman, which is north khartoum it was like I, the first two days was hard because we were live near one of the conflict zone in half five bridge um, but after that it starts settling so all of the committees immediately start like working to actually help the store reopen and um, and then survey actually people in the neighborhood what they need to do what do they have and we've actually shared the food like so it would be like okay you have this you have that then let's let's like uh, you know like there is this family that's need you know like a supply of bread or like a supply of like meat so we would we would provide that because uh, they've provided this information and then they actually. I think the hard part was just to trans like the transportation because it was not safe. So they would transport the food. They would try to help, you know, like uh, the injuries because then like all of this random shooting, of course, people are start, you know, like uh, needed the medical support. Um, I think right now, 56, 66% of hospitals are non-functioning in Sudan. Um, so they were trying to find like local hospitals and like, okay, let's try to find a small clinics. Um, uh, there is actually a very good initiative that's happening, uh, that happened in, 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 in where I live in, in Omdurman, where there's a small hospital called Ennau Hospital in Omdurman. So they reopened the whole hospital. They had no experience on how to reopen a hospital. They did that and they start bringing doctors because it's easier for doctors to go to like a smaller clinic than try to actually access central hospitals in Khartoum or like in the central, um, in the capital. So they provided that and they reopened the hospitals with a very, very, very organized like groups of volunteers and groups of medicals, even medical students, really like everyone just tried to use like their expertise, their experience, trying to provide the help. Uh, currently, this hospital is actually filling for 13 other hospitals. They are covering for that, not just for the injuries and like uh, direct aid, but they're actually helping with like um, like all of the other like, you know, like critical condition, like people with diabetes and like, so they are providing that like uh, supplies whenever they can, because there is really a shortage of, of the supply. So they are the one who's holding the country. Um, I, I actually attempted to evacuate one time and I had to go through main conflicts area in Bahri and Khartoum. And the one like the people who saved me to actually find that would save what the resistance community, because literally people will be going out of their home amid the fight to help people and say, don't take that route because there are civics here. They're going to take your car. Don't take this route because there are looters here. So don't try. So they will be guiding us until we actually like kind of like have that safe, safe place. So they were everything, police, security, humanitarian organization, they were everything. So. I really appreciate how you frame that is that they were everything. They were the social services, they were the advocacy. It never like ceases to amaze me how generous Sudanese people are, even in times of you know distress and conflict. And so Khalid, I wanna go back to a comment you had made about 
sort of the climate right before the month leading up to April 15th. Uh, for those who might be hearing about Sudan for the first time, or maybe last heard when Omar Bashir was ousted in 2019, can you just give us a bit more context as to like what you recall, what is the context around how this is different from the uprising of 2019? I think sometimes there's a bit of conflation of, is this an uprising as well? Is, is this a war? Is this a conflict, a crisis? So just curious to hear a little bit more. Um, so the, the, you know, Bashir was in power for 30 years and um, they really had a strong grip on um, uh, on the government, and they infiltrated everything. Uh, the 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 party, the NCP, uh, the National Congress Party, which is the the party of Al Bashir, and they're they're very proud of that. Until today, they say that we infiltrated every part of the government in Sudan. Nothing can run without us running it. So they 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 become the the bureaucrats, the civil servants, everything. And with everything, with that, everything just deteriorated. Everything fell for the last 30 years. There, you know, even before that, actually. But everything was deteriorating. Um, with the Arab Spring, 2011, uh, that uh, protest started in Sudan. There was first serious protests in, in a while. Um, and then it continued. In 2011, it was put down, actually, by Hemeti uh, uh, and his forces, because uh, for Bashir, uh, creating uh, the rapid uh, response uh, forces, which were then called al Janjaweed. Um, and you just this the story of Hemeti uh, as a whole is just it's it's an incredible story of of you know someone that came from uh, you know he's not educated. He came from a, a very simple tribe and and living in the west of Darfur. Um, the government using him to take over uh, his his uncle uh, militia. Uh, and to basically overthrow his uncle for him to become the leader of the militia and put the put his uncle in jail. Um, and I think he's he stayed in jail for like a, a really long time. Uh, he just he just came out um, I think a, a few years ago or something. And for him to lead this militia, um, helping them to control uh, the rebellions and in, in, in the rebellion in in the, in the west of Darfur. And with that, he became a superstar, basically, uh, because he can do what the army can do. He knows the country. And uh, there is a lot of, of course, uh, 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 tribal issues as well that uh, that he could solve from there. Um, Hamiti for al-Bashir was called Hemaiti. That's why he called him. Hemaiti means my protection. So he believed in, in Hamiti to, to be the, the only thing that stands uh, against all his enemies, right? And and with time, they became a lot of enemies, even from inside the NCP. So uh, in 2013, the same, you know, another re revolution attempted to happen, protests started to happen, and it was very, very bloody. A lot of people uh, came to the street, a lot of people died. And it was kind of the first shock of something this um, um, deadly happens in Khartoum. Uh, we're always used to hearing things happen in, in Darfur, th things happen in the south, but never something happens in in um, in, in, in Khartoum, which is also, um, I think there was an article by uh, uh, Nasreen, I think it was called Khartoum, the Selfish City or something. And it was it's uh, uh, very accurate on that because it's it's kind of like you live in, in your own bubble. So from 2013, very deadly, this is when Hamidi started coming to Khartoum and his forces coming to Khartoum and buying uh, and with that, of course, uh, I think, you know, he he uh, had control of gold mine in the in 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 in, in west of Darfur. And according to, a, I think, um, um, an interview in Al Jazeera, I think he said he had three, three gold mines. So this person started creating his own army, creating his own power. And he was just exceeding everything uh, uh, around him and everybody around him and doing it in silence and giving the Bashir the protection that he wants. When the revolution happened in 2018, it was a revolution. It was a peaceful revolution. It was a beautiful revolution, but it was also a palace coup because the the people that came with international support um, were the... Um, the, the the security committee, I think that's what they're called in, in English, uh, Ismail, uh, the um, 
اللجنه الامنيه يا هذا سكيورتي كوميتي يا so they 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 came to power and he was one of them i think international uh, community or basically the region wanted to avoid what happened in yemen because in yemen there was always uh, al houthi and he was not uh, included in the post revolution yemen and this is where the war started so for them the the safest bet to have a stable sudan was to include himati and his rapid uh, response forces into that committee that will rule Sudan after al-Bashir. Um, and then from there, this where we are right now started is that because there were two captains of one ship and one very rich and very uh, committed to get, get to the chair and the inter the, a lot of uh, the, the, the regional powers um, understood that and supported him to do that. And he went from the camel herder in, 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 in the west of Darfur to someone who is super eager to get to the chair and he, he sees that he, 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 he um, deserves that. If, if I can add to what Khalid said, I think one way um, of, of thinking about this current, the current fighting between the Sudanese army and the rapid support forces is that A, um, the Sudanese army, um, despite the revolution of 2018-2019, still um, within the army, um, a, a large segment uh, of it is uh, still made up of those loyal to the former regime. Um, that's, uh, that's one thing. Um, the RSF, the Rapid Support Forces, in essence is really a, a Frankenstein monster that uh, was created by the army to, uh, as a, it starts as a militia uh, to aid the army in putting uh, down rebel groups in, in, in the western part of the country in Darfur. And then it emerges and, and rises to create its own um, economy, its own uh, um, uh, you know, access to weapons. It, it, it's a parallel army. Um, uh, to the official army. Um, with the 2019 revolution, um, a part of um, the goals of the transition, uh, what was hopefully a transition into democracy, um, was uh, were, were elements that uh, I think um, the, both the army and the RSF were very concerned with. One, um, security sector reform, uh, and what that meant for uh, generals in, in the army and uh, top leaders of the RSF, um, accountability and justice. Uh, and then um, uh, the, the, uh, within Sudanese politics, legend uh, the, the, the removal of the empowerment. Um, empowerment was, was, a, was a, um, a political process where the government of dictator Omar al-Bashir uh, empowered his party, uh, those loyal to him uh, within government. And, and the, a part of the process of the, of the transition uh, was to remove um, those who came to power through that process. Uh, so these are, I think, three, uh, two uh, main, uh, three main issues um, that um, uh, the army and the RSF were very concerned with. Um, with, uh, with, with the hope of transitioning into a democracy. But I think the final issue, which was really what led to this uh, fighting, um, was with the security sector reform, um, um, that the RSF would be made, um, would come under the official army. And at the end of the day, uh, um, the Sudanese army is an institution that has been around you know, for over 60 years since Sudan's independence. Uh, with all the criticism that we have, uh, think of the army, uh, but the, uh, but the idea of a militia as a parallel army that starts as a tribal militia and then widens and creates its own economy and recruits from different parts of of the country and uh, tries to uh, reimagine uh, or redefine itself. Um, I think uh, I think was really the trigger um, that that really brought this fighting about. Thank you. And I mean, in many ways, you're describing a very like a power grab between, you know, two men who are using Sudanese civilians as collateral. Right. Um, 
And I think it's a very complex history, like where Sudan is positioned, who borders Sudan, uh, who are the international playmakers that have a and like a vested interest in seeing, I think Khalid mentioned, you know, like not wanting Sudan to become like Yemen, Yemen also being a proxy war, you know, um, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit to like the situation at the borders and thinking about how Sudan is also a refugee host country and all of those that are now twice, three times displaced. And so just curious to hear from all of you about that. Can I, can I just, can I just say something? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, it's for me the the narrative about having two men uh, fighting as as equals and the 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 army is you know it's because this is how um, I've seen the the media tries to simplify Portrayal. what's going on in, in Sudan and I, I I don't believe that that's the right the accurate uh, uh, description of it because uh, as Ismail said it's the RSF if you ask their videos, everything they talk about, even if you've seen video, like photos of their offices, they hang a picture of Hemeti on the wall. So they are loyal to one thing. They don't know anything else. They're loyal to one thing. Whatever the leader says, this is what they call him, the leader. The army has a lot of fractions. Like they, they could be Islamists, they could be, you know, is it, a, no one, I think, in the army says the name Burhan. I don't think they were like we're fighting for Burhan. That does that doesn't that doesn't happen. He happens to be the leader of the army at, when this happens, but I think the army fights more because they are the army of the the the, the country. This is it's 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 an institution, and whatever we think of that, but that's that's what it is, and it also uh, fights for its pride. I think more than more than a, a lot of other things because for the army to be beaten by a militia that it sees that it's not even uh, um, official. They're not, they're not, uh, they're not trained um, um, army. Uh, they're not military trained. Uh, you know, they call them uh, khala, you know, like aqid khala and whatever. So I don't know how to translate that in English, but it's, it's, this is, I think this is a misconception that really needs to be uh, corrected, that the army doesn't fight for Burhan. The army fights because it's it's you know of of the things I've I've mentioned before. Thank you for clarifying, Khalid. And I, I think to your point, because of the layered nature and of this conflict, so often the media and those of us on the outside can fall to these like narratives around like what is happening. Um, so thank you for that clarification. And so just to go back to uh, questions around um, what the bordering countries and those who have you know, were refugees in Sudan and are now facing added displacement. If either of you could speak to that, I think Soeba, you were gonna. Yeah, speak. I think that the situation in at borders is like, again, like it's whoever is holding this is citizens, Sudanese people, volunteers and resistance committee, because there is no help at the borders. Uh, so just it's flooded, like all, all borders are flooded. I've been to Port Sudan and I've just seen a southern and southern of people at the marine port. And some of them would be they will be talking to me like, oh, we've been here for like a week. We've been here for like, I mean, uh, I, some of them were like been there for like 10 days. And uh, because it's also getting expensive to like leave Khartoum and leave. Uh, it's not just Khartoum, by the way, where the conflict is happening. Uh, and we can talk about that later. There are many other cities. So I just provided Khartoum as an example for the borders, like most of the people who are now in the borders of Egypt and Saudi Arabia in, in Port Sudan, which is the East Sudan, are like flooding from Khartoum. But there is also people who are also going to Tashat, um, like uh, West Sudan. And there is also like South Sudan. People are like taking refuge there. Uh, everyone, I think the one thing that everyone is sharing is like, it's just hard to, to access. Uh, there is relatively easier process to go to Egypt than other countries, but it's still like, it's very difficult, especially like, uh, you know, like you just have thousands of people coming and providing food and access and supply. Some of them are just like elderly and like people are like, again, like if you're, if you're having a diabetes, then you have to like take your medicine and then like you need to have a, a like it's very hot in Sudan and there is no electricity. So most of the time these medications are ruined by the time that they are in the borders. So we start seeing and hearing a lot of people dying or like suffering. And I, I remember actually I was evacuated by an airplane um, uh, to Hungary. And I remember there was, a few people who needed like an urgent medical assistant because they were just diabetic and they they just needed the help and they were in coma 
um, all the way until like the airplane landed. So it, it's very, I think the situation is getting really hard in there. And I feel like this is where, uh, if you are as an organization, like especially I'm talking here about like all of the UNs and all of the international organization, if you cannot access Khartoum, why are you leaving the borders? Like that's for me doesn't make sense. Like it's safe there, there is no fighting. Why are you not helping people at the borders? Like people need that. Um, also like it's 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 hard to say that, but there is even for you to evacuate, that's a leverage. Like you do, you need to have like money, you need to have like access to so many resources that many don't have. Like I've seen people who like wanted to leave and they have their families. Like in Sudan, we don't have refugee camp. People will host you, even if they are like, even if they don't know you, you just go to another city and you will find someone who would like help you. But then like to get there, how would you get there without the food, without the money, without all of that? So I think at least like providing that access of like, if I can go somewhere, help me with the transportation, or if I'm in the border already, why like there is no help? At least like providing that um, immediate relief and support. And, you know, like, so this is what that people have been trying to do. Uh, but there is again, like access, limitation of resources. How would you get this medication? How would you get food? Um, money is no longer a thing. Like there is no value for money because there is really what you need is like food and medication that you cannot buy. So like you need that supply to come from one of the borders. And that's why I think all of the neighboring countries, they have a role to do for at least helping whoever get or like providing that access to supply so the supply can come to Sudan because currently all of, all of the supply is completely destroyed in, in inside the country. We just on, on the numbers, um... The latest numbers that I saw, uh, the fighting has been about a month so since April 15. So about a million people displaced, a uh, quarter of a million um, fleeing to outside of Sudan, into Egypt, to South Sudan, to Ethiopia, um, from Port Sudan to Saudi Arabia, to Chad, uh, Central African Republic, and uh, three quarters of a million uh, displaced internally into Sudan to other regions that, that are a bit safer. So those are the numbers. But I think as the way was saying, it's it's a, somewhat of a privilege to even uh, be evacuated, uh, those who have the money. And you can imagine with with the, uh, you know, the, the, the a war economy, um, the, the, the cost of being um, evacuated uh, rises uh, by the day. Uh, when I left um, a seat on a bus to leave Khartoum, about three hundred dollars so the day before it was, was five hundred. Uh, that was two hundred. Yeah, and I think today it's, it's almost a thousand, uh, just for one seat to get on the bus. Khalid, um, I think also like one thing to 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 highlight is that you know to go through Saudi, you have to have a visa to go somewhere else. You cannot enter Saudi as a Sudanese. You, if you don't have a visa, you can't go. So it's it's uh, the only options available and uh, are Ethiopia, South Sudan, and Egypt. And Egypt, at the beginning of the conflict, uh, what used to be, uh, of course, it was a lot busier, but it used to be easier to get in. So young men wouldn't, uh, the visa wouldn't take uh, a long time. From two weeks ago, uh, two weeks to three weeks ago, the visas sometimes still takes more than three weeks. And I know people that have been waiting for the Egyptian visa now for three weeks. Um, they're stuck with just, you know, backpacks and their kids and and they're trying to find places to uh, uh, to stay. And some of them went um, back actually and went to, to, to find other villages to stay in like in Dongola or in Halfa or whatever until they can uh, obtain a visa to leave, which also, again, costs a lot of money and a lot of things are... Um, you know, you have to you have to think about a lot of things. Even if when you get to Egypt, how how much are you gonna stay there? How long are you gonna stay there? And how how much is that gonna cost you? And even the prices there are getting more. Um, and the same thing is in uh, Ethiopia, and it's harder to get to South Sudan. So it's it's not just like you get to the border and and you know you you go in uh, just because you're Sudanese. Because if you don't have a visa to go somewhere else, it's it's really hard for you to go uh, through Saudi. Thank you all. It's clear that the logistical element of having to acquire a visa, having to coordinate your own evacuation, it's, I, I actually kind of feel at a loss for words sometimes when I think about folks who are faced with the impossible decision of like 
it's not a choice to leave, right? Like you don't leave a place that's your home. And so to think that on top of that, there are all these, you know, barriers that are placed. Um, and one thing I want to, you know, obviously in the context of what's happening in Khartoum, a lot of the narrative is centralized to talking about Khartoum. But of course, we know that there are decades of, you know, violence in Darfur, Nuba Mountains. We know that this conflict right now, they continue to bear the brunt of it. And so I'm curious to hear just like, what is the context like in places like Kurdufan and al uh in Nuba Mountains, in Darfur, just for folks to think a little bit beyond Khartoum in this context as well. As we speak right now, there is actually like a very heavy like battle happening in Niala, which is in, in, in West Sudan. Uh, Dunena. Dunena is a very strategic city. It's, it's a city in West Sudan, but it's also is with the border of Chad. And many of these groups actually start formalized in, in Darfur. Uh, some people argue they're actually like part of the troops that are in the border. I mean, they are Sudanese, like let's just face that. So a lot of them are Sudanese, but the Dunena is a very strategic city because um, there's a lot of troops in there. It's with the border of Chad. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's been like, there's a lot of also like, camps that started since Darfur war in 2003. So um, so this is like, it's it's erupted. Like there are so many cities that are impacted. al is one of them. So it's like the West, the central. And I think that the the the, the part that is really scary is like the, the fact that this, this fighting is moving to so many cities is like, it's really the dominancy of whoever, like when, like if there's anything that call winning, but like if the militia is winning this, then like they are really controlling, like not just like one like part of the country, but the whole country. So the fighting is is happening. There is, um, yes, I think two days ago, the fighting in Jenina, there were 200 people died over three days. Uh, the fighting in Khartoum now for civilians, there is over 500 ferry. This is just what we know. So many people, so many, many people just died of starvation that we don't know yet because we lost, like people lost communication with uh with like their families is just like, you don't know, you cannot access, but you're assuming they're alive. But those that their document is as dead, like 500, and then you have the 200. And I think the fighting in Niala today, there's just like so many people uh, died in between. Uh, so yeah, it's like, I think in terms of like historical context of that, like the, the Bashir regime, like really like when they started the war in Darfur, I think like maybe the whole world knew about what's happening in Darfur, but not the Sudanese people because they kept that. Like the media was very misleading. There was a very targeted campaign. Uh, there was eth ethnic you know, cleansing happening. And then people assumed, oh, there's just like, this is just rebel groups. So people did not understand the, the nature of the fight because on purpose, this was like actually a whole part of the Bashir regime is try to like brand this as like us, like actually helping with uh, like removing all of the rebel groups and like not really reflecting what's happening. So I think that like ignorance and that's like misleading from the media continue to happen. And then over time, people have not like, the, people start realizing what's happening in that point very earlier after like the war almost ended. And I think this is still impacted like how people will look when they think about Central and when they think about that. Also historically, Khartoum has been like, uh, it's a capital, but also it's like most of the elites and privileged are living there. So there is also the fact that like when something happened in Khartoum, we would probably hear louder than other places because it's like historically this is where like colonies started. It's like where people who are actually close to the colonial, like, you know, like uh, colonism, they were like um, get the, there was the elite, they get like a privilege of education, like not in comparing to other cities outside Khartoum. So it was that, that like perspective of central versus rural area uh but i would just like like say that like the fighting is happening everywhere and i think like i mean i don't want to like kind of mix the questions but i think a lot of people share the perspective of Khalid of like this is the army this is the official army of the country and like they're not i agree they're not fighting for burhan but who created the militia like who did that we sudanese this is not our war this is not the sudanese people war like we have not choose 
to like either parties. Post this is this whole regime is like there is there is a lack of legitimacy for this regime. So like they are created the militia, they've empowered the militia. All of the like the the place that um, Ismail was describing. This is a very centralized like place in Khartoum. Like if you have a militia, you don't empower them. You give them all of your strategic position. You've actually depleted the military resources. And like we have like I I think one unit that is functioning in the military, but all of the other were actually like replaced by the militia. So it was a choice of the military, of the Islamic regime for the militia to become like the military. So I think for me, I'm just seeing two militias fighting each other. They've like, they've done nothing, but just like bringing the pain to the Sudanese people. Uh, I think a lot of people now see the hope of the military as like, maybe we're finally gonna have our military back and they will defend the country, but they are the one who created the devil. That is not our problem. This is not our war. So I think now everyone is seeing that. So if you talk to someone, and I know, on the audience here, we have people from Darfur. If you talk to people there, it's like, if you're killing me, if you're the one who's killing me, how would you want me to trust you again? Like it happens like that, it happens like from two, almost 20 years ago and it's still happening and it's gonna continue to happen because we keep using the same people. We keep trusting the same criminals. We keep like having the hopes that they would change, but this fight is not about the people. They are fighting for their own ego. They are fighting for their own dominancy and they are fighting for their own control. And I think this is what just makes it really hard because you see that. So I think what's unique about this is everyone now knows what's happening in Darfur, what's happening because they are seeing this now happening everywhere in Sudan. Thank you. Ismail, would you like to add to that? Okay, <laughs> Khalid. Um, uh, so I think something that has come up a few times is like the role of the international community or lack thereof, should there be a role? So just curious to hear from all of you, uh, to what extent should the international community be involved, be that governments, be that people in an ideal state, what would that look like? The um, international community was involved in trying to push or a, the, this transition. Um, again, with the fall of um, the government of Bashir in 2019, um, regional players, uh, um, intergovernmental bodies, the African Union, the Arab League, uh, neighboring countries, Ethiopia, Egypt, um, the UAE, I mean, have all been involved in trying to um, design some sort of, of, of transition. Um, and uh, I guess one of the reasons, again, for this, for this conflict was this push for um, um, rejuvenating uh, the transition. O October 2021, 20, um, the military, um, again, for those who are not you know, following closely Sudan, uh, there was a, a coup that uh, dented the transition the the democrat the the the, the this period of transition uh, and for over a year uh, there have been negotiations with the intermediaries from the international community to revive that that transition and there was hope that there were um, that they we were coming closer to some sort of agreement uh, what was no what was was known as the framework um, uh, agreement um and, until this fighting that recently happened um i think what what is needed at the moment is a um, fresh ideas um, um yeah clearly um the components of the sudanese political process be the army the military the army and the rsf because they form i mean i think one way to look at sudanese politics um i argue is is three main circles uh, you have the military with its components, the army and the RSF. You have the uh, various pro-democracy civilian forces, forces of freedom and change, which was a coalition of different uh, um, Sudanese uh, political actors, uh, the resistance committees, the, the civilian forces represent uh, one circle, and then a, a, a third circle of the old regime. Um, and they were all competing um, 
for for power um, within this this transition. Um, how international intermediaries have been dealing with um, these various uh, forces, I think, needs to change. Um, I think there should be consequences for uh, what has happened, um, and and um, uh, clearly the idea of. Um, treating uh, the spoilers of the transition as serious uh, participants in the transition is something that needs to change. Thank you. Khalid, would you like to add to that? I think a, a, an important point is also to say that the, the people who are fighting now are the same people that did the coup against the transition together. So Hamidi and Burhan led the coup in October together against the government. And now they're fighting against each other. Uh, and uh, the, in, the international community, again, they um, prioritize stability over the real issue of democracy and uh, le legitimizing them even after they committed a mass. So, so, it's, so after the revolution, the first thing that happened was they shut down the 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 sit down the 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 sit in at the in front of the HQ, the army HQ, and that was done also by the military forces, both both fractions, right? And that was a massacre. They cut down the antenna for I can't remember how long. They uh, started cracking down on media. They started cracking down on everyone that, uh, including. Uh, 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 ambassadors, international ambassadors on television, uh, saying that they 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 um, um, they support uh, what was it like? They were they I, I still remember the report until today on 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 Sudan TV that they showed the I think it was the Dutch the Dutch ambassador or something, and they said that he was he was giving out drugs to to kids or something like that. This is after the massacre, and then after that again the international community came again legitimized them, sat down again with them, both Hamidi and Burhan, brought them back into power again, agreed to, to speak to them, brought back the, 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 the civilian forces, um, who some of them were hurt actually in, in, the, in the massacre. Again, continuing with that, have forming the government, during the government, of course, the third party, which, which Ismail mentioned, which is the old, the old regime, uh, in alliance with the the army because the army understands that they cannot run the country because the former regime runs everything they are the bureaucrats they had everything in the country they know everything so this this is one thing what they why they kind of worked together in collaboration to to kind of um mirror what happened in egypt for example or what what or uh what what, what happened in, in in yemen to basically again stabilize when things were going against what um, what they wished for, they 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 made the coup again in October. It's and from then it was it was definitely downfall, but downfall. But they didn't they they when they didn't find anyone to fight, they fought against each other. Thank you. And in recalling 2019, one of the like primary slogans was like Medania and this like call for. You know, civilian-led government, and the all, most of us outside remember like Hurriya Salam um, Adala. And so, I'm curious, Swab, if you could speak a little bit to the sentiment around like a pro-democracy, like on the ground, like Sudanese people being energized by the prospect of a democracy, whether in the future or just in general, because so much of the narrative focuses on like the depiction of like the army, the military leading the country, but just curious about like the pro-democracy sentiment on the ground. It's very hard, uh, I think, because I think especially at this time for people to hold into this because from 2019, people had this big dream of like the new Sudan and they embodied that during, and I just, just for context, we just mentioned the sit-in, which is what with, after 2019, after the revolution, people sat in front of the military headquarters with the hope that the military would actually support their dream for democracy for a full civilization government. Uh, but, and I think they keep hold, they they kept on like holding these dreams, 
and 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 the pressure from the political actor, the internally and also the international community was to like settle with the settle with the government. And I think they kept pushing that and they kept on saying no, like no for negotiation with the military. And that was actually the models, like no negotiation, no bargaining and no, uh, I don't remember the third, no, but like there was like, they were just like holding their noses, like that we are not going to sit with these actors. We are not sitting with the same people who committed the uh, just the sitting crack, which is like the, the 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 massacre in June. So the people kept on holding this democracy. I think what I see right now in the ground is like the one thing that keep people going is like they knew that if there is any solution, it should never involve any of these players. And and they knew that for a new Sudan to happen, these people has to be out, like has to be out of the picture. So um the way how they are forming all of the help, all of the support, all of the democracy, I think it's hard to see like all of the death and blood and burning and, and kind of keep that hope, but uh, but people are not leaving. And I think that's just like one way to show that they're still holding into this dream of like, we are, not, we are gonna get this country back. But this revolution has always been a peaceful revolution. The people choice has, always been we're never gonna get like we're never gonna hold a gun we're never gonna get like a bully and now they have to deal with all of this blood and they have to still keep these hopes so it's, it's I think the choice now for them is like how can we stay peaceful and how we can hold our dreams and how we can continue to fight so the way how they formalize that is through let's just be everything let's be the government let's just like help people on the ground so I see I see I see still people like dreaming and thinking um i see them actually acting and i think for me i see the hope because i've actually seen a real government on the ground on the lack of government so i think that's how you're not just dreaming but they're actually acting on it um but it's it's difficult thank you and curious to hear from uh khalid and ismail just i guess your perspective on the potential for democratic principles and institutions in sudan given the current state. Yeah, like a <laughs> um, I think at the moment it's it's just very hard to um, anticipate, evaluate, uh, understand uh, what the coming weeks, months, and possibly years uh, hold. Um, um, Ideally, of course, I think uh, many still hold on to this uh, hope of um, Sudan transitioning into a, a, a democracy. Um, how to solve this immediate conflict, um, I think, is something um, is is going to be very complicated. Um, just looking at the experience of the Sudan's uh, surrounding countries in Libya, in Yemen, and Syria. Um, and uh, this idea that both sides are hell bent on destroying each other. Um, so there are many possible scenarios. I mean, uh, one side victorious uh, over the other, the army over the RSF or the RSF over. And what does that mean if, if the army is able to destroy the RSF? Uh, does that mean a return to the old regime? Um, if the RSF, um, uh, is victorious. It, it it opens up a completely new um, chapter uh, in Sudanese politics. I would say even in in continental politics, the idea of a militia being, um, uh, you know, uh, ruling the country. Um, can some sort of negotiated uh, peace deal come about? I I don't see that immediately happening. Uh, so I mean, it's it's very hard to see. I'm sure many people still uh, are hoping um, and uh, for um, and holding on to the idea of uh, of a, a a democratic Sudan. Um, how that will happen, I think, uh, is it's, it's it's really difficult to see what. Um, with the coming weeks and, and months uh, holding to them. Khaled, do you wanna? No, I think uh, Ismail covered it all. I mean, this is this is, was one of the the the, the first things that um, that I was thinking about during when since the conflict started is each outcome and what it means, and. Um, 
if the army wins, what happens? Because you know, it, every, every the army has the regional support of uh, the Egyptians. The RSF has the regional support of uh, the Emiratis, and uh, so the UAE. We we don't know for for a fact what's happening, but we know that, for instance, Libya's Haftar. Uh, is also supported by the UAE, and there there was uh, news of air air dropping um, weapons to Hamidi uh, during the first days, and uh, uh, when he was at uh, the Marawi airport, when the fighting erupted there, and this, so this is this is this is not like unique to Sudan the situation that we live in right now. This is not um, something that. You know, the, the region hasn't seen before. And it's also a, a fight between um, the new forces of change in the region and um, the old regimes in uh, these countries, which are almost always aligned with the the uh, um, the counter revolutions, of course, of the of the of the Arab Spring. But what what stands out here is that, the the um, old regimes are Islamists, and most of the the new um, uh, empowered um, authoritarian regimes are are basically anti-Islamists. That's the that's that's the way that the the region has been looking since um, since the Arab Spring. So there there I don't think there will be any support for um, the the. Islamists from the regional power, and there's 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 no money basically. Like, who's going to rebuild this? Who's going to do? It? They have no support. They absolutely have no support in this internationally. Um, Hamidi is coming to power would be would look something like the Taliban coming to power in Afghanistan. I think that that would be the closest thing that we have um, of on the ground right now of. Uh, internationally uh or the houthis running sana um it this is basically they can they can continue with the system that's happening but they can't come up with um functioning um uh, government i mean they they have they controlled tv and the radio station the main tv and radio station in umdurman since the beginning of the conflict they couldn't air a song nothing nothing came out of the tv and this is basically the show of power in Sudanese politics since the beginning of the modern state of Sudan, is that in every coup, people will head to the TV and will, will, will issue a statement. They couldn't do that, even though they have the TV. So that tells you how they, they, are, they can run a country, definitely. So it's, 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 it's really, um, It's, it's all up in the air. We have no idea what's going on because we don't know what's going on on the ground. We don't know who's talking to who. We don't know the, who from the, the regional powers is supporting and how they're supporting and how's that support coming in. So it's 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 really, um, I mean, with, with this lack of news, we, we really don't know. Every, anything anyone says is just uh, analyzing a situation, but we have no idea what's going on. Thank you. And both of you spoke to the role of the regional powers and sort of empowering or holding up either the RSF or the Sudanese armed forces. Can you speak to these failed ceasefires? Who are they failing on the part of? And just, you know, there's so many talks of like, uh, you know, ceasefire talks are happening in Jeddah and, you know, the media cycles that conversation in and out a bit. But I'm just curious to hear your reflections on particularly the role of ceasefires, why they're not being uh, respected, and if they if they were to be respected, like I mean, you've already said a few times, the prospect of democracy is a little bit hard to see in this context right now. But just curious about particularly the role of ceasefires and the very numerous failed attempts at this point. Well, I, mean, I, I don't think the ceasefires are. Um, it, it's still relatively early, so I think both sides think that they can. Um, um, impose their will on, on their opponent. Um, uh, one of the reasons it took, uh, you know, um, those of us in the building that I was in um, 10 days to leave is that uh, every time there was talk about ceasefire, it was too dangerous to, to leave. 
Um, so I, I think at the moment, um, um, uh, while uh, the attitude is that um, that one side uh, thinks that it can um, defeat the other, um, I think the, the, the talk about ceasefires um, is, 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 is going to be very difficult to uh, uh, maintain or respect. Um, but again, uh, this, this comes back to the, the role of the international uh, community or those who are in uh, the intermediaries in, in, in this conflict. Um, I think uh, there has to be consequences. Um, and, uh, and, and unless there are consequences, I, I don't think, uh, I think at this point, both sides still think that they can defeat the other. Thank you. Khaled or Sueba? I, I think the one thing that I'll just add, like it's for me, the player, like the it's it's happening in Jeddah, and uh, like this militia, like the RSF, for those like who it, it, they haven't only fought in Sudan, like they're not only the Janjaweed, they are the one who actually they've used them in the Yemen war. So it was the United Arab Emirates and Saudi who've used the militia, the RSF, to actually fought in Yemen, and I think they, until very recently, a lot of them came back from Yemen, and a lot of them actually came back from Libya. So there is also questionable really on the player and their interest on that, but giving the good interest, like hopefully that would be good like that, because I think uh, Saudi definitely has like impact on both parties, like on the militia and on the, on the military. Uh, but I think it's just like, I, I agree, like this is my, it's just more of like them having more time to like kind of reorganize their groups and then just like have this, the, the, the next like battles happening. So, uh, but I, I'm just really questioning the whole like interest of what's happening on Jeddah is like, is it really for a peace settlements? Because like this were the very active troops that have fought in Yemen and a lot of their empowerment didn't only come from the gold in Sudan, but they also came from the money that they got out of this war. So, um, I mean, I, I'm still hoping, I'm really anti-war, I, I hope this to end soon. So any settlement that will bring a ceasefire, permanent ceasefire is, is, is what the people needs right now because we don't want this plot to continue. But this like, uh, I don't know, like like even the agreement that like came, like the, the initial like outcomes of that were very, very, very vague. Like something of, I think they said something about like, uh, ceasefire till like, something about like uh, until uh, like it was there was no even certainty about when is this going to happen how it's going to happen like so there was just really no clarity about that so I hope this is really like mapping out the the route but in the way how we see this happening right now is just not um it's it's not something that you can trust thank you Khaled um I, I think one one interesting uh um uh, thing as well is the 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 extent of of uh, of the tribal influence on the RSF there in, in the last uh two weeks or so a lot of videos have been showing up of um groups on Facebook and 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 accounts on Twitter or whatever of Ar uh, Africa's uh, uh Arab Arabs of Africa Right, so you have people from Niger, people from Chad, uh, people from Mali, all saying that they support Hamiti, that we are uh, we are in support of that. We have no idea if this is just propaganda, what's 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 happening. We have no idea, but these these videos are showing up, and also looking at um, the Chad and politics of, uh, of the side of things, because um, the Zagawa tribe, which are in 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 charge uh, with Dibi and Dibi son now ruling uh, Chad, they are against Hamiti and against the RSF because this will make the a power imbalance in Chad as well. So the Arab tribes in Chad will um, also revolt, maybe or support Hamiti, and maybe that will drag on to to the Chadian politics. So this is one thing also that that's. Uh, also out there as well is 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 this is this balance of um, of powers. Um, there's also a huge social media component to this, uh, the propaganda war that's uh, that's happening, and uh, the the RSF use of um, uh, Twitter account in English um, 
using terms like terrorists, uh, um, uh, Islamists, of course, just to kind of uh, speak to a Western a Western crowd. Um, th there is a, um, a lot of, I think, uh, people who are handling their social media, um, they've they've also been uh, identified and so on. The army, on the other hand, is is not doing a good job at all in any sort of uh, propaganda videos at all. So it's it's um, that's also one thing to look at. Thank you. And so just with the remainder of time, since we do want to open up to audience for a few questions, if each of you could just offer you know, whether it's a few takeaways or just a framing of the conflict, perhaps that you want people to really have a grasp of to make sure we're understanding and talking about Sudan accurately. Uh, so just a short answer from everyone before we turn it to the audience. So. Um, I think my main takeaway, I think probably I mentioned this earlier, this is not our war, this is not the people war. Uh, so, uh, I guess the one thing I just want to make sure that people, I've seen this in some medias, like people call this civil war. This is not a civil war. This is a power struggle. This is a power struggle between two parties that they just want to dominate and control. And I really like, because when I saw that in one of the like really like well-known news, I was like, this is a, this is misleading. People are not fighting. You don't have a civil war. Like we're, we're not, we're like, we've suffered enough from war, literally, like from independence in Sudan. So no one will ever like, I think, like, think about like, we would want any party to dominate. So this is not the people war. Um, I guess my main takeaway, I would say, my daughter was with me throughout this whole journey. She's nine years old. And uh, one time when we attempted to evacuate, it was very hazardous. And we came really through like, they would not like the, the car would literally be just like jumping up because of the sound of the bullet. And and she was so scared and her dad was a stop and they were like almost get arrested. So we were so like it was a very hard journey. And we took 50, 500 miles to kind of go to Port Sudan. So I've, I've been like trying not to have this as a traumatizing experience for her. So all the time I'll be sharing some, but not sharing all. And then when we came here and I was talking to her and she was like, uh, someone asked her, like, how how do you think? Like, what do you think about Sudan? She's like, it's not the safest place, but I want to be back. I want to go back to Sudan. So I think that's just summarized everything for me about like this, what's happening. Like people, she had she she seen she saw everything, but and she was not like I think she was only two years old when she went to Sudan. So this was like her actual experience, like going through Sudan. So. I guess that's my takeaway is like, uh, we're going to be back. Inshallah, we will. I mean, I think what is happening, um, this is a, a, a new wave of, of, uh, of politics in, in Sudan um, with events hitting the capital um, it, itself. Um, what, what happens, uh, I think, in the coming again, weeks and months, um really has the potential to reshape uh, I think the, the history of the it's not a civil war yes it's a but it has the potential to become a full-blown civil war with um different peoples in different regions possibly arming themselves to protect themselves from whomever um the growing ethnic and, and tribal rhetoric um uh in the country um, I think uh, there's a potential for it to uh, truly become a full-blown civil war if um, efforts are not made uh, to, to come to some sort of resolution um, quickly. Um, uh, and, and that, I think, would be just not only sad for Sudan, but for the, for, for the, for the continent, for the region. Again, Hamati represents a different type of, of politics. Uh, the idea of a militia uh, leader um, in control um, of a big country like Sudan, I think, is is just a very dangerous uh, president in, in 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 the country. And I think it, it's something that uh, it's why it's it's important to keep uh, pay attention to what's happening in the country. Thank you, Khalid. Um, I just think it's very important to remember that the fact that we st still don't have 
a civil war since the revolution until today is a miracle. And it shows how much Sudanese people have uh, been patient leading a peaceful revolution with, with all that's happening, facing a massacre, facing a coup after coup after coup, facing uh, and an now a, a war between uh, the army and the RSF. And we are still peaceful. People are still peaceful in Sudan, even with the looting. And there was, you know, this incredible video a couple of days ago as well of, of a, a man uh, getting ready for prayer. And you can see for in the background, people are just, you know, a lot of looting is happening in the, in the market and the man just still didn't move. There's this, this shows you how much Sudanese people have um, hope for democracy and hope to start a civilian role. And it's, 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 uh, even you know if 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 you look around as well in, in social media you see the hashtag #hanabnihu we will build it it's 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 a, it's back again this is this is the hashtag that started in 2019 with the revolution people coming back saying we will build it we will build Sudan and now even with all of these things happening people are you know posting pictures of 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 the burnt uh, airport in, in Khartoum and you know all the main buildings of Khartoum, the banks, da, 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 and they're still they're posting new renders of it, artists and designers and stuff, and they're still saying we will build it. So we need the international support. We need your support, all of you sitting there. We need that because you, the, the first thing that happened when this happened is everybody left. There can't be stability in Sudan without the help of the West. That's that's that's. This is where we need that your help there. Thank you, Khalid. And I want to turn it to the audience for a few questions before we close out. So Nazareth is walking around with the mic. So we have a question here and then in the front. Um, first of all, I'm not a soldier. I'm not military. I'm a painter. I'm a, I'm a fine artist. I just came over here as usual to, you know, do some personal things, you know. Um, and I bumped on this issue of what's happening in Sudan. Actually, in the 60s, when Nigeria did its own, they, I mean, we used to have peacemakers, the elders, Ali Selassie, waited in. And everything uh, could down. So I wonder why we can have something that is not sophisticated like peace uh, organizations and whatever. Just our elders among ourselves. Because the way you narrate all these things, I don't think it's something too uh, too complicated that we can settle among each, uh, among ourselves. So why is it that we don't have elders even among the Muslims? or among the Christians, or even among the traditional elders in our communities, to just call the war, warlords in a corner and let them settle the rifts. So I don't know what's happening to Africa right now. I'm just, uh, like I told you, I'm just a painter <laughs> from Brooklyn, so I'm not a soldier. Just for the record, your, your jacket is the jacket of the Sudanese police. <laughs> that's, I think that, that's why he gave the disclaimer. He's like, the... <laughs> just a painter, he said. <laughs> yeah, so anyone can take the question, but I think what you're speaking to, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is just, I guess, is there an, a possibility or an effort for more kind of local homegrown ways to negotiate uh, from elders, from people who maybe are like looked up to in communities. And uh, yeah, curious what your thoughts on that. I think, um, I mean, at different levels of trying to uh, come to solutions, I think that that would be a part of the process. Um, um, uh, particularly as uh, the impact of, 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 of war, of conflict, uh, socially and, and on generations in different communities, um, how that could be done at the, at the very top level of the, um, of the fighting uh, parties. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how that could happen, but I can see it definitely a part of, of a holistic approach uh, 
perhaps um, you know down the line. Thank you. And I think we had a question right here. Hi, um, this is amazing. Um, my name is Fatima Sisay. I was born and raised in Sierra Leone. So this is very personal to me, um, being that I went through the war as well. So I know how everybody feel. Um, I'm a multimedia journalist. I run my platform inside the diaspora, hence why I'm here today, because I believe in us telling our own stories and it's very fitting for me to be here, you know? Um, I just wanted to ask because um, I forgot his name. But he mentioned, yes, he mentioned what we can do out here. So I'm very passionate in terms of getting involved. So whatever you have going on, please let me know. Thank you. It's not Thank a you. question. No, but no, we, but... <laughs> we're so we're grateful to have you here. Thank you. We appreciate question it. Here in the front, and then I see. Quite a few in the back, so I'm going to let Nazareth move the mic around. <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank uh, the African Center here for organizing such event and its group for facilitating it. And I would like to thank the panelists and the moderators for this uh, wonderful enlightenment. I know it's a very painful enlightenment, but still. We treat our heart. We are far, and when we see you, you just came from Sudan, you brought with you a lot of pain. And I hope that by the time you and us will recover. Uh, I have to think quickly. I'm going to mention them quickly. The first thing is about the international intervention. The international intervention is yet maybe to come. But I see that they used the policy of containment. It was done since uh, the takeover of the, of the regime uh, of al-Bashir. So containment, they containing, they trying to reach deals with the civilian, the military, and they try to, as Prime Minister Hamadok used to say, a unique system. But unfortunately, it failed. So what do you, from your perspective, what do you think will be the next step? What kind of uh, deal will come either out of Jeddah or out of you know, the people's demand in Sudan in the very near future? That's number one. Number two, I'm quite sure you suffered from the airplanes. The airstrikes was one of the worst things to happen during this war. Usually we are in New York here, if there is any enemy, it's gonna attack us, there will be a siren and we'll go deep to cover ourselves. Unfortunately, in Sudan, we don't have any sirens. Unfortunately, in Sudan, they don't tell us that they're gonna attack. And unfortunately, we don't have uh, bunkers to hide. But the big unfortunate is that they are shooting and aiming into the cities, into the Towns. I lost my aunt just a few days ago with two shells in her neck. It was very painful. It was one of the kindest aunt I ever had. I know she's no different than other murders, but I'm quite sure, I'm quite sure through your campaigning, can we do something to stop this shelling, this massive shelling? Can we work together with the international community and the Americans and uh, you know, all those who devoted themselves to save human? Can we do this just for a second and stop this shelling? Thank you. Thank you. And I'll barak of you that Khalid Ismail, either of y'all can take that question. I'm so sorry, Baraka Fikum. This is really difficult because I feel like uh, everyone that I talk to, my family, everyone has someone they lost uh, just within the past two weeks. So it's it's very hard to think about that. It's very hard to come here and try to be professional and then like like you're telling a personal narrative. Thank you for sharing. I know it's how difficult it is to share. 
Uh, I, I think the one thing that I would say, and, and I think it's not like the blaming game or like the victim game. It's really more of like people take a responsibility. Like Sudanese people have done their part. They've overthrew a dictator that were staying for 30 years. And from day one of after the revolution, like international community kept on forcing solutions that involve settlements with this military group. And despite all of the people voices, I think people didn't listen. And even just like the recent UN units, let's buy Volker, like they were just all like really forcing people to settle. And they were like, as Khalid said at the beginning, really providing legitimacy to this regime. So we want this to stop, like you cannot like, like all of the international community talks about like we don't deal with terrorists, we don't like you are actually like funding them, you are supporting them by giving them this legitimacy. Like it's not a, it's not it's not a government, it's a regime. Like it's a coup. This is still a coup, and that's what people have been saying. Uh, so the previous like prime minister, like the was the people like choice, like he, he he came as a part of this revolution, and he was forced to settle. I mean, he settled. I don't know if it was forced or not, but he settled with the coup, with the, with the coup leader. And this was accepted by the international community. Not just accepted, it was like try, they tried to force this upon the Sudanese people. And then Sudanese people never stopped protesting. Like literally, there is an ongoing protest every day since 2019. So I think the one thing from the international community is like, please listen to the people. Please stop giving legitimacy. Please stop giving Power, please stop empowered criminals. Like they, that's exactly what's happening. So I think the one thing I know this is a small group, but I feel like thank you, Fatima, for also sharing. Like, what can we do? Because like we don't want this to be a forgotten story. Like, look at the news. Where is Sudan? Right? Like, it's like I understand all of the challenges, but like we don't want this to become a forgotten story because there is actually really people as we speak right now dying. There are children. There is literally a child. Who was shot yesterday a baby a baby like an infant who was shot yesterday thankfully they saved him they're still, he's still he or she is still in a critical condition but this is what's happening on the ground for the people and i think like this is your role like you are like when we think about the us or the uh, african union or the european union your role is like protect democracy and people have done their part of like bringing this like to end and they needed that so what sudanese people felt is like you fell them to like for their path to democracy because you kept on like supporting the enemy and they see this coming a lot of people as Khalid said at the beginning and, and ismail is like People were like, there was a lot of signs, but I think people saw this coming because you kept on giving power to the to the wrong, like like to, to these generals. So I think this is what, like my, not just the hope, but I feel like I want them to hold responsibility about that because like people, like they have nothing, like everything they are doing, they're trying to keep this going, they're trying, but you need to start really putting a pressure a real pressure, not just like a com like put this into action. It's not enough that we condemn. Like don't condemn it. Just do something. Like try to do something. Try to actually stop this. Try to pressure them because I think no country can function without relationship with like others. So if if the if 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 all in like all of the I would say main players, international community said no, like you have to stop. I think there would be a real pressure on both parties. But they knew that because even now, as I said. Uh, conversations happening in Jeddah, but so they were like the one who are like funding the whole Yemen war. So like, are, what, what, what are we talking about here, right? So let's see, you have to like, like put the utmost pressure, not just condemning what's happening. You have to put the utmost pressure of actually like pushing both parties to stop, like the, to stop the fight. Politically, that's, that's a different story, but at least for now you have to stop the fire and it has to be permanent. So that's the role. And I think for the people, like that's for the government, I think for the people, keep this story going, keep all the suffers, keep all of the other stories going. And I think this is like, when we think about media, like it's like, it's not about what's happening and it's a new story. It's about like really telling the truth of what's happening in the world. And, and this is really a story that's happening as right now. So I think you help us by even just tweeting about Sudan, even just like sharing a story about like Sudan. There are so many like resources that are really good resources that like you can look at and just like keep sharing the story, telling the world that this is really happening. And it's not just another forgetting story that the whole world will forget about. Thank you. I think there's a few more questions. Nazareth, how many more questions are we going to take? Just to, okay, we're going to take three more questions after this one. So um, go ahead. 
<clears throat> Hi everyone, my name is Walid Walid Al Jack. I'm a Sudanese American. And um, just for background context uh, sake, I've been to Sudan like quite frequently throughout my life, probably adds up to a few years if you do the math. Um, but I guess this piggybacks off of your remarks. Um, I had a question related to how to spread awareness on kind of like a major, like like outside of us individuals, but also like on a major like media network scale. Um, I personally got in touch with a reporter and to keep um, anonymity, I won't say the name of the reporter, but she works for the Washington Post. And I felt concerned um, because as um, someone that reached out to her to um, communicate the concerns of our community, um, af like after we had our first touch point, she mentioned to stay in touch because um, she wanted to get a, like a hands-on um, kind of perspective of what's like kind of happening on the grounds. And um, one, um, I remember I shared a case that many of you may be aware of, uh, Nura's case um, that, um, that that occurred the, the the sad rape execution case, and then um, she followed up and said, um, "Right now, uh, right now we don't have the bandwidth to focus on individual cases. I'm afraid her case is certainly sad, um, but it's not unique because so many people are trapped." I understand her case is tragic, but for now we have to focus on the main news that will affect most people. So as someone that is Sudanese American, that, you know, my family has done so much for Sudan, like dating back to my grandparents and like, my, like I'm a very active member of my community. I'm taking a step that I feel is, should be a win to get in touch with these major media outlets. Like how can we improve how we're spreading awareness on that level? Because we do have members of our community, like there are just the distant relatives of mine, the Al-Bakr family, that are reporting a lot, they're doing a lot on the ground and they have like since for decades, and that's just an example, but for the major, for the, mem for the members of the media, the major media outlets like that are not a part of our community, how can we improve um, how we spread awareness to them and, and increase our traction? Because I feel that like for me personally, like I see a lot of, great content and a lot of great posts. And I post a lot of great stuff, but sometimes like, I feel that like when individuals post, it might not get as much traction as it deserves as if these, as if this content was being leveraged by like major media um, outlets. So I just wanna hear like the thoughts from each of the panelists on these remarks. Um, I mean, I think, um, I mean, you just continue to do what you uh, said that you did, contacting uh, journalists. Journalists will read, uh, normally read what um, uh, gets sent to them. And, uh, um, you know, particularly if there's an interesting angle, something fresh, something new uh, to add to the story, uh, uh, most journalists will, will certainly consider that. So I think... Again, you know, with, with social media, uh, getting hold of journalists via their emails uh, on Twitter, um, I think uh, most journalists uh, tend to take seriously, uh, consider um, if there's something uh, fresh and new um, about the material that you provide. Next question. Well, um, my name is uh, Hamza Ibrahim. Um, I'm from Sudan. And thanks for the center over here to hosting Sudan issue today. And I just have a comment and I have a question. My comment is this, because uh, we are the Sudanese and I'm from the West Sudan. We keep saying about what's going on in Sudan since 2003, black life is matter. People get killed by this SRF. 
army, pro militia is a dangerous. But a lot of people, they don't believe at that time. A lot of people, they say, oh no, you guys are this and this. But right now it's happening. I just want to comment about what's going in Darfur, especially in the West Darfur. There's a five state. Today, the war is going in Guinea, Niala, Al Fashir. And a lot of UN staff get killed in Darfur. Their uh, car, the, the uh, vehicles are stolen, and the people are starving because more than two million people depend on UN food aid. And that West Darfur is a drought. Is have, they have a problem with the water, and there is no access because they used to be things coming from Khartoum. A lot of people they don't have no food today, and there's a fighting going over there. But the people in Khartoum, there's a war, but people they able to move in North Sudan, and they can able to move to some part, and those part is a little bit wide. I'm not saying there's a no war there, but in that forest war there. And when things UN did, and it's a mistake, because they move when the peace agreement came, they move their peacekeeper from the un, uh, unit. It used to be over there. They have a stable in the ground. They used to make a report. The RSF people, they don't do a lot of things. But since they move those when right now it's become vulnerable for everybody. People, they can't travel from city to city, people, they trap in the cities. So we need from you and from you guys over here to make a voice for the people in the West too, because Chad is a long black country and it's a big problem over there. We have a water problem too. We have a sanitation problem. There is no medicine. A lot of doctors get killed. A lot of doctors hijack from Kidnap, I'm saying they kidnap from SRF, and it's a lot of things going over there. So another thing I just want to say the, on this one, what my question is, what we are going to do, what tools we are able to put pressure at the UN to have resolutions to stop this war, what tools we can able to push those countries who are they using the proxy proxy, like SRF, to pay them, bring them the guns, to killing people or to fighting. Right now, they have a negotiation. This negotiation is not going nowhere because any one of them have its own support. Some part they're pushing. I'm asking all the Sudanese people, they have to put their differences aside because there's a politics that what is bring this one. The politics of the Sudanese people right now is put the country in a war. So we need a lot of Sudanese people, they have to rally, but they put their differences aside, they put their hand together, they put the pressure at the UN, at those countries who they are bringing this war in Sudan, and the country is destroyed. Uh, and thank you very much. Thank you. Either of you would like to take that? Yeah, I, I, I think we can all speak to that, but I think, uh, like, first, yeah, we talk about, when we talk here about this, and even in this panel, we talk about all Sudan, not just part, and we've actually listed, uh, I think, Hamza, you joined a little bit late, so we talk actually about how many people just died, like, over the past three days in the Jenin, which is 289, just the one that we were, like, the that were reported. So I, I, I think the question about what to do is really, um, I agree with like, I think it's hard to like have that because I think everyone tried like the path of like trying to push the UN, trying to push the international community. As I said, like there was really no, they were not listening. But I think in this time, uh, the one thing that I think would be helpful is really unifying that no war, like like having that like very big movement. That's how it is like really pushing all of the regional players specifically into like providing that uh like providing that context of like these people are not accepting this to continue even one second after, like as, as we see all of this blood. So I think like for me personally, I think the way for it is to uh, 
to to give to 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 like to put a pressure on our own government as Americans. We do have that. Like we do have our legislators. We do have our like councils. We do have our House and Congress. Uh, I've sent to Senator Schumer like probably I don't know thousand times. Like there is really no response. They don't care. Unfortunately, Democrat or Republican. So I think this is a time where like we can provide like as an American. I think that's our role here. At least I'm specifically talking about here is like like putting that pressure on our own legislators of like this is like like international policy is like part of what you do uh like i don't even want to start about the response about the whole u.s department like even for for the sudanese american who lives in there so i think we have to provide that like um really work together on like putting like calling them and having a campaign and like pushing them off like this is has to stop now and it's not just like what the for like what the uh what the um U.S. like like uh, what the U.S. Department would do with is just like us actually as citizens utilizing our own like uh, uh, like powers of actually provide like putting that pressure on our own legislators. Uh, but I think regionally in the region, that's that's a very difficult question, and I, and I don't know who can provide that pressure. But I see the U.S. playing a big role into into even influencing the regional prayers on this. On that. So I think we have two more questions, one here and then one right there in front of it. And then that'll be all the questions from the audience. I understand what you're saying with regards to providing pressure here in the United States, but there also are regional organizations, the OAU, which is right there in Ethiopia and Addis Ababa. Why wouldn't you put a pressure on them? They have a, I would, I would assume, a clearer understanding as to what's absolutely going on and also having to deal with the migration of people coming across the borders. So wouldn't that be a, a more um, appropriate organization to try and bring into the discussion to help, you know, uh, close this gap between the, this army and the R RSF? I, I think all the uh, regional players that have uh, some interest in Sudan, um, the African Union or um, the countries will, will probably be playing some sort of role uh, as intermediaries between uh, I mean, the fighting parties, uh, uh, not just also the, not just the RSF and the, and the Sudanese army, but also bringing back the process of, of the transition. Um, the African Union has have been playing a, uh, an important role uh, since 2019. Um, I imagine that they will continue to play a role. Um, I think the immediate and more impactful uh, players are, are some nation states in, in the region uh, like the United Arab Emirates, like Saudi Arabia, uh, like Egypt, um, even Russia, um, the United States. Um, I think uh, these are the, the more um, immediate, uh, impactful, I think, um, bodies. But but the African Union and, and other international, about EGAD, International Governmental Authority on Development of the Horn of Africa. I think all these these bodies will be playing some role, uh, role or the other. We literally need everyone. <laughs> I would just say that, like, we need everyone in this, and like, um, no, like, it's not like undermining any role. But I feel like, like, all these power has to work together to get us to some place. But unfortunately, the like some of these powers impact has been negatively on Sudan. So one of them, I just mentioned the example of Saudi and Emirates on like how they've like empowered the malicious group. So I think like uh, there is concerns about like some of the interests about some of the regional powers, but I think uh, at least I agree on helping on the borders. That would be like the immediate relief. And I think when we talk here, we talk about two type of, of support. There's the humanitarian support, which is can be led by organizations, volunteers. And I think in this one, everyone who can access Sudan, please support Sudan. That's what we can like, we just like, we will like, 
there, like there is a real cry for help in there. Uh, but I think that the other aspect, which is the political aspect of stopping the war, that's the, the complicated piece of like all of these different parties playing different roles and they have different interests in, in different aspects. So we have one more question from the audience before we close out. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Ahmed. I was born in Sudan, but grew up here. You guys mentioned that this isn't yet a civil war, but there's potential for a civil war. I'm curious what concrete scenarios you see for that to happen. Uh, you mentioned that there's potential like fissures or hot areas in Darfur or the Western region, but are there other areas in like Northern Sudan, Central Sudan, Eastern Sudan that maybe could pick up arms or close to pick up picking up arms? Uh, or do you see it maybe like the RSF or the army could like potentially start recruiting other tribes? Like what, like how could it possibly, and like it's hard for people to get medicine, hard for people to get out of the country. How could possible people, you know, normal civilians all of a sudden start picking up weapons or is it, Maybe there's a shelf life on optimism during war and we should start like planning for that. And is there anything that could be done outside to mitigate a potential civil war? So, so when I mentioned the, uh, the idea of a, a full-blown civil war, um, for the past few years, um, you see growing ethnic and, and tribal and regional rhetoric uh, in all parts of Sudan, uh, including the north and the center which were typically more uh, calmer places um, in, in the country. Um, the idea that uh, like today you have no really functioning government and no protection, no security, where communities start to arm themselves, um, uh, start to use ethnicist and tribalist rhetoric. I think that's the danger of the situation that you have right now. Um, that you establishment of of of, of uh, armed groups um, that um, claim to be defending uh, certain regions and certain ethnic groups against others. I think that's the danger that we were seeing right now. So that and and, and we've been seeing that kind of rhetoric on social media for the past few years. Um, uh, some of it racist, some of it ethnicist. The idea of protecting one part of of, um, of Sudan against the other, um, that's where I think the danger is. I mean, there, yeah, uh, there's also um, the Juba Treaty, right? Like there's also six other armies that are in Khartoum and they came together uh, in a peace process uh, during the during the um, uh, the intermediate government with with uh, with Hamadok, and so there are other armies involved. They are just not active yet, but there are other armies, and they're uh, from the west, from the uh, uh, southwest. There, there's numerous armies, and these are the ones that all, that just got asked to sign the peace treaty and uh, join the government. There's other fractions as well. So there's a lot of uh, um, military groups that are around the country. So that's 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 even another uh, uh, issue to think about as well. Um, they still haven't um, uh, announced or or supported a side over the other. But the the Juba Peace Treaty is is there, and that that holds together also a lot of armies. And the fact that um, um, tribes are going to start taking sides today. Uh, the um, al Nazar, so like the head of of of, of uh, the Misiriya tribe in in uh, west of Darfur, uh, announced their support for the RSF. And this is this is the first time uh, that a tribe um, announces its its support for anything uh, in in this war. I mean. So it's um, normally these videos will show up and someone will say that we are the tribe of so-and-so and, -so and we, we support uh, al-Bashir, for example, we support whatever. And then the next day, the, the tribe will say, no, this is, we don't know who this person is. And, you know, it's like a social media war. But uh, today this person showed up and, and of course, I don't know, because of the lack of the internet or the lack of communication or no one, no one um, objected to that. So it, it is, it will start. Uh, definitely. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, you know this this 
uh, rivalry between uh, the army and the RSF is not only built on 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 what's what we see right now. It's also socioeconomic class, historical, uh, uh, tribal. It's 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 a lot of things, and um, so this has um, a lot of potential to 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 definitely implode with other armies involved and uh, citizens. Uh, basically taking arms and of course like uh, what can happen is what happened in in, in Syria as well with uh, uh, generals in the army defecting and 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 uh, becoming their own army which is also another uh, issue that we have to um, I hope we don't have to face Thank you. Just adding a quick yeah. thing here. Also, don't forget that this is the same militia that committed genocide. So they are they are like uh, this is what they do. So like uh, so the the potential is not just like because there are so many villages, there are so many cities that were burned uh, over the twenty years. People living in 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 camps, and now like this is again an additional thing that's happening. So there is already like the lack of like um, infrastructures, like the lack of like, uh, so like the lack of even like the the identity because like these people lost their homes, like, and they've like so many generation were raised, uh, you know, like out in, in camp. So there is just so many potential. <laughs> I think I, I really try to avoid the civil war, but I, I like the, the war civil war, but I think, on the ground, this is what's happened. So, uh, and also like really lack of education. Like a lot of these soldiers are like teenagers or children. So it's like that's part of what they've been doing is like you've you've destroyed education. People don't have so that's what they do for them. The way to survive is to hold the gun. So that's um, I think that's uh, adding to that. Thank you. So tonight we heard many details around what's happening in Sudan and. I think the resounding sentiment is that not a single Sudanese person in this room around the world is removed from what's happening in Sudan. And like we said at the beginning, the personal is very political and the political is very personal. And so I urge all of you, especially non-Sudanese folks, non-Africans to ask and question why Sudanese have to be at the forefront of their own struggle, why they have to self-mobilize on their own. And the hashtag keep eyes on Sudan, it's not just a hashtag, it's truly a call to action. And so, you know, if you believe Black Lives Matter, you believe Black Lives Matter all over the world. If you believe in democracy, you believe in it all over the world. And so just, I really urge all of you to remember that these stories, these people, they're not just like random numbers, you know, these are like real families, real humans who are dealing with immense devastation. And so thank you all for coming tonight. This is not an easy topic to hold for anybody. And so just grateful for you all holding space. And again, keep eyes on Sudan. Sud Sudanese people have not given up on ourselves. So please don't give up on us. So thank you so much. And big thank you to our panelists for you know, sharing their own stories. And thank you to the Africa Center as well. And Khalid, thank you. Sorry, we kept you up. Uh, uh, thank you everyone thank you to the Africa Center for this wonderful series and excited to see what's next home isn't just where we're from It's the sounds that move us. The stories that shape us. And the flavors that heal us. It's the communities that connect us. The ones that hold us down. The ones that raise us up. Home is a feeling we all know. So if you're looking for it, you can always find it here. The Africa Center. Home is here.